everyone on behalf of center for counseling and wellness management and iqac i welcome you all for interactive training session on the topic gatekeeper training for suicide prevention the world suicide prevention day is observed on every 10th of september the world suicide prevention day theme for this year is creating hope through action suicide prevention day is observed to eradicate the misconception that talking about suicide will make someone feel more suicidal but the fact is there is a need of suicide prevention awareness there is a need of people knowing that it is okay not to feel okay at times and suicide can be prevented by talking about it and also by spreading awareness about mental health to do so we have amongst us dr peter castellino a consultant psychiatrist and man managing trustee of kuj mental health foundation a ngo which works towards promotion of mental health in goa he has vast knowledge and expertise in the field of mental health he would be enlightening us about hands on training for suicide prevention may i now request our principal dr saba de silva to welcome our and introduce our resource person and address the gathering good afternoon and uh, thank you archana for introducing uh, the whole concept for today it is uh, entirely my pleasure to welcome dr peter castellino who goes as director of kuch he is also the uh, managing trustee he is all in all he is the consultant uh, psychiatrist and uh, he's he's the brain behind the entire kuj uh, foundation kuj which stands for cause of our joy um, this is uh, a basically a suicide prevention program which of course he will tell you more about we are here today to go through a workshop which is very aptly titled gatekeeper training workshop it is meant to have uh, the intervention skills Uh, polished as far as prevention of suicide is concerned we all know the 10th of september is the day but we are not too late uh, to to have this kind of a program certainly interventions should not be late maybe this program is late which dr peter castellino will tell you about now i have known dr peter castellino for a very very long time and uh, i know him from the days when he was just about finishing his medical studies a good two decades have gone by from then uh, he is uh, uh, an expert in this area he has um, i think he has had over uh, you know uh, hundreds of such sessions um, he is a person who uh, really feels the pulse of the system and there could have been no better resource person to be amongst us today now for the benefit of dr peter castellino i would uh, at the cost of repetition as far as students are concerned uh, inform him uh, that kare college of law is uh, marching ahead in uh, different areas of um, of of social justice of uh, social legal uh, growth we are having um, a uh, association with so many institutions in the state national even international we have uh, a lot of programs that we conduct both in house for students as well as uh, those who are not really students of the college and we conduct on uh, on a regular basis the uh, two undergraduate law programs one which is done after the 12th standard one after the Uh, the graduation course and we also have masters program in law and of course we have a phd uh, program which is offered through our research center so without much ado i will once again welcome dr peter castellino and and i look forward to uh, you know enriching my knowledge more in this particular area and i'm sure he'll do a great job thank you very much thank you sir for the welcome address for the benefit of our resource person today's audience are mainly the undergraduate students of law and faculty members 
of uh, of our institution and i would like to make a note that since this is interactive session all the participants are accepted expected to uh, participate may i now request dr peter castellino to address today's gathering So please unmute yourself. Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you, uh, Archana, for the kind introduction and also for inviting me. And also to my dear friend, Dr. Sava De Silva, who, as you said, we've known each other for, uh, for more than two decades. And it's so nice to see both of us actually growing in our own professional careers. And uh, it's been a journey for, for both of us. And I thank you for inviting me to talk on a topic which I'm really passionate about. And, uh, and yes, uh, so we, we're never too late to understand suicide prevention. And uh, it, it's not about the day, but it's something that we, we have to face every day. And, but yes, this is the suicide prevention month. So, so it can, uh, uh, gatekeeper workshops can happen at any time. Uh, one thing that I'm, I, I'm really excited about is this year and the last year also, we have seen a lot of institutions actually inviting us to, to talk on this, on this topic. Something which, uh, when we had started our program in 2012, we actually had to beg institutions to allow us to address this. The principals would actually often tell us, please do not use the word suicide. Please use the word, use another word, use the word stress, use the word depression, but please do not use the word suicide. And, and we found it very strange, and, but that was the reality at that point in time. Uh, you know, uh, before I go ahead, I just want to tell you that um, the, the Ethernet service that we normally use uh, <laughs> went off today. So I'm actually hotspotting from my cell phone in my clinic. So in case I get calls, the, the connection may go in unstable for a little while. So please bear with me. Uh, uh, yeah, so as uh, Archana mentioned, we are going, it's going to be interactive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would like, I would, I would like you all to use the chat option uh, to put in your questions, to put in your comments, to put in uh, whatever thoughts that you have, because um, uh, the entire 90 minutes to, to two hours is going to be an interactive session. And the more we interact, the more I understand what you think, you understand how I think together we learn more on the skills. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so my, my first question to everyone over here. Okay, uh, Preeti Naik, can you hear me? Uh, am I audible? Yes, uh, doctor. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm audible? Okay, fine. If at any point I'm not, please uh, use the chat option. And just tell me that I'm not, so that I would, would know. Or just tell me. Yeah, so uh, the first uh, question that comes up is, is suicide really a problem? Now, yes, uh, I mean, it, we know it's a problem, but is it really a problem that we have to spend the next one and a half hour to understand in a law college when there are so many other pressing issues? There's the COVID to talk about, there's other illnesses like heart disease and diabetes, and there's, there's HIV, AIDS, and there's so many other issues. But is suicide something that we really need to be spending the next one and a half hour uh, to two hours on? What do you think? Yeah. So uh, as I said, please use the chat option. Okay. Type in your, your answers so that I also get the feel of what, what you're thinking. And uh, I, I have always been told that Kari College, the students are very dynamic and they're outspoken. So <laughs> I, I, I would like to, to, to get your feedback because the whole uh, 
time, this whole one and a half hour will, will depend on how we kind of communicate with each other. You know? So uh, I, I am assuming that you are taking a neutral stand that probably you do not know the answer. So uh, yes, it is. Yes, our students are. <laughs> Otherwise, like dynamite. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. It is important since there are so many cases of suicide rising. Yes. So there are. Uh, we we are hearing a lot about suicide, and we do read about it on the newspapers, but. Um, uh, talking about suicide is important. Yes, it is important, Stephanie. Uh, and, and why? So my question is, if you look at statistics, if you look at globally, how many people do you think end their life to suicide every year? I mean, uh, can, you take, can you take a rough guess of how many people end their life to suicide every year? Globally around the world, yeah? Can you throw a figure there? So uh, annually, there is around 8 lakh. Yes, Dr. Maria Goretti Simois, thank you so much for that. Uh, but I would like to go with Stephanie that says 1 million because 8 lakh is the reported cases, what, what is, is actually spoken about. But we know that the figures are much higher. And one of the reasons is because of underreporting. So yes, around, let's go by global statistics, around 8 lakhs. In fact, this year, the latest statistic that come out is down to actually 7 lakh and some odd figure. So it has come down a little bit and we're very excited about that. But still, it is huge. But India, India contributes to almost 17% of this 8 lakh. So what we're seeing is that we can argue that the population of India is much higher and therefore... Uh, Therefore, the rate of suicide is much higher, but we have, a, we have a country which has a much higher population than ours, and that is China. And China's rate of suicide is much lower than our country. So if you look at India, the rate of suicide is almost 11.4 per lakh population. That means out of 1 lakh people, there's 11.4 people that have ended their life to suicide. Now, my question to you is, do you think in Goa, the rate is higher than this national average or lower than this national average? Remember, Goa is a highly literate state, number one. And number two, uh, our e economy is much better. So our economy is better, our literacy our rate is much higher. So now from this background, do you think the rate of suicide in Goa is higher than the national average or lower than the national average? Please put in your comments. Lower, lower, low, low, low. I, it may be lower, okay? It should be lower than the national average. Thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, the rate of suicide in, in Goa is higher than the national average. Uh, it is 16.8. Uh, so it was, uh, according to in 2019, in India, it is 10.4, it actually came down. 11.4 was around in 2012. So in 2019, it came down to 10.4. But in Goa, from 15.4, it's actually gone up to 16.8 per lakh population. So, uh, yeah, so I would also suggest that, uh, I know we can Google the answers. So if we, we, we let's not Google answers, let us just um, try to uh, think. And, and kind of get the answers. But, but you know, the problem doesn't end over here. So when we're looking at 8 lakh people, when we're looking at 139,000 people in, in India that's dying to suicide, we are looking at only at the deaths. The problem doesn't end with the deaths. We have to understand for every person that dies to suicide, there are almost 20 more who attempted and survived. So here the problem comes in. We are looking at the, the figures of attempted suicide multiplying by 20. So 8 lakh into 20 are the number of people that are 
that are attempting suicide. On an average, let's take it at 20 million people who've attempted suicide somewhere in the world. From those 20 million people, around 8 lakh or 1 million people actually die and 19 million people have survived. But again, the problem does not end there. The problem continues because for every person that has died to suicide, 20 have attempted and survived, but almost um, almost 30, uh, almost 100 more are thinking about it. Yeah, so that is again something that we need to be, uh, uh, be, uh, we have to understand that, that is a, that's a fact. And therefore, now the, the number has gone to almost 100 million people around the world are thinking of dying somewhere in, in a year. So the problem is huge. Now, if I ask you a question, do you think suicides is an issue in young people? Do you think suicide is an issue in young people? Okay, yes, yes. Okay, so everyone is, says yes. And you're, you're right. If you go to uh, the rate of suicide, I mean, if you look at the causes of death among young people between the ages of 15 and 29, suicide is, I mean, it is it's stated as the second leading cause of death in this age group. Between the ages of 15 and 29, it's the second leading cause of death. And do you know what is the first cause of death in this age group? Anyone can take a guess. What do you think would be the first, the leading cause of death in this age group? Between 15, yes, you're right. Ronald, you're right. It's traffic, road traffic accidents is the leading cause of death in this in this age group. But now what they're trying to, what the, the new research is emerging is, is pointing towards suicide as being the leading cause and traffic accidents going in second place. But if you look at both these, um, these causes of death, they're preventable causes. And this is something that we need to, to look at. They are, they're very preventable causes. And if we can, put in certain measures in place, we can actually work towards, um, towards reducing the death rate in young people. Now, do you think uh, we've, looked at, we've looked at suicide rate in young people and abroad between the age of 15 and 29, but let's focus only on students. Do you think it's a problem among students? Yes, so everyone is saying yes. And if I ask you a question, and I want you to put a time of duration to this. If, if, if I make the statement, one student dies to suicide every, put a time. Every year, every month, every week, every, I don't know, every day, every 10 seconds, every five seconds, every, put a time to that. One student in India dies to suicide every, what do you think? Take a while guess, put enough, every 15 minutes, every minute, every hour, every week. So let's look at all this. So if you're looking at every day, that means we're looking at 365 suicides in a year. If you look at a week, we're looking at uh, 52, 52 weeks in a year or 54? Gosh, I think it's 52 weeks, right? So around 52 suicides in a year. If we look at every minute, oh gosh, I, I can't do the math over there. Uh, okay. I don't understand why these red lines are coming on the screen. Uh, can you all see these red lines coming on the screen? I am not sure why it is happening. Uh, Archana, are you able to see these red, are these red lines there on the screen? Yes, yes, they are visible. Uh, okay, it's not from my side. 
Okay, so more at all. It's it's not from my side. I don't know what's happened, but um, but I will continue. I will continue. Yeah. So um, so uh, the right answer goes to Kate Fernandez, who says every hour. So if you look at every hour, that means we're losing twenty four. Sorry. So we're losing 24 people, 24 students to suicide every day. And in fact, the latest statistic says 25 students. So it is little less than an hour we are losing a student to suicide somewhere in India. And if you do the math over there, it comes to almost, uh, if you take 25 uh, students to suicide, it roughly works out to more than 9,000 students dying to suicide every year in India. Now, if you look at 9,000 students, now, if I ask you, what is the strength of uh, students in Khari College? What is the strength? Uh, how many students are there in Khari College? 450 students. Okay, so now I'm going to take my calculator out and I'm going to do that. That's 9,200 divided by 450. That is almost. If you look at Khari College and you take 20 Khari colleges, the students of 20 Khari colleges are dying to suicide every year. Now you'll understand how, uh, how big this problem is. Yeah, so uh, suicides in young people is an issue. Uh, okay, now if you look at in India, uh, these are the rates of uh, suicides in various, uh, various union territories and states of India. If you look at Andaman Nicobar Island, it's, it stops it at 45.5. Goa is at 16.8, as we can see the national average being around 10.4. Uh, and if you look at this slide, you will see uh, a lot of southern states of India, like Kerala, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, okay? They've got very high suicide rates, yeah? And if you look at North Indian states, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Jammu Kashmir, you know, their, their rates of suicide are much lower. So it's very interesting that you'll see Southern states of India, which are high literacy states economically better. Their rate of suicide is higher than the South Indian states. And, and, and one, anyone can, can explain what could be the reason for that? Why is it that Southern states in India actually have higher uh, rates of suicide? Anyone can throw any insight into that? Excuse me, sir. So, yeah. Uh, can you just uh, put off the PPT and uh, present it again because of the lines? So you mean you want me to uh, stop sharing? Yes, sir. And can you present it again? Okay. So now I'll re I'll reshare it. Yes, sir. Oh, how did that happen to my side? Uh, no, it is not from your side. There was some scribbling uh, that happened from some participant. Okay, no problem, no problem. Yeah. So, um, so, so what what could be the reason? So, one of the reasons what has been documented is that maybe with um, okay. That, uh, Stress caused due to high education expectations. Yes, yes, Stephanie. Yeah. So uh, one reason can be the stress that comes from uh, from the high expectations, and also it can be unmet needs. 
Yeah. So if you see uh, with higher education comes higher expectations. And when a lot of those expectations are not met, that could lead to a high rate of suicide. Also, the expectations from the educational system and generally expectations for life. A study is being done to see, the, if you look at the origins of, of South Indians and North Indians, South Indians were more Dravidian. So Dravidians were more the, the intellectual. They, they, they took on, you know, they kept, their, their mechanisms of coping was not very good. But if you look at North Indians, they were generally warriors. They were Kshatriyas. They, they, they fought. So they kind of, uh, if they didn't hold back their stress. They, you know, they, they kind of learned to just mitigate it and to fight back. So this could be some of the reasons that, uh, of course, studies are being done. But also we are looking at something which is very, uh, uh, very realistic. And if, if we look at South Indian states, our death reporting system is very good. So all deaths are reported. Of course, I, I will not say that all suicides are being reported as suicides, but at least all deaths are being reported. So therefore, since we have a better reporting system, our suicide rate may, may reflect a little higher than the North Indian states. Okay. Uh, and if you look at some of the ways or the means in which suicides in India take place, or is mainly through pesticides and hanging. And if you add firearms, then those are more common in the Western, Western regions. But again, if you look at the ingestion of pesticide, that is a uh, very, um, we can do something about it. You know, if we regulate uh, how uh, pesticides are sold and how it is uh, available to, to the common man, I mean, that's something that we can prevent. Hanging also now that the, someone has come up with a fantastic fan, which no one can hang from. But as soon as you hang, from the, try to hang from the fan, the fan drops. So there are ways in which we can actually deal with these methods of suicide. And but right now, these are the most commonest means uh, of suicide in our country. Now, if you look at this map, which is a global map, okay, and here what we will see is uh, yeah so what we will see over here is that the, this is a map of 2016 here we see that uh, the countries with brick red are the countries with the highest suicide rates and then comes orange yellow and then the pale cream and then the final is the white where the data is not yet available but india brick red comes in the, the, in the country which the rate of suicide is much higher on an, on an average, that was in 2016, uh, along with uh, Northern Europe and Northern Asian countries like Russia, the USSR, um, and some spot, spots in Africa. When you look at China, China actually brought down the rate of suicide uh, significantly. And this is something that we need to learn from. We need to see that countries have actually brought down the rate of suicide in their countries through, through various policy decisions. And therefore, policies in suicide prevention are very important when we look at uh, the, the gross uh, ways in which we can uh, reduce the rate of suicide in our country. Now, uh, for, for us uh, and for you being uh, law students, this becomes a very important area of prevention, looking at it at a, a broad level, but also at a personal level, this, uh, this workshop will help us to learn what we can do at our level. So uh, it's important to know that every 40 seconds, somewhere around the world, someone dies by suicide. Yeah, we said one hour for students in India, but around the world, around every 40 seconds, someone is dying to suicide. But what happens in the 41st second? See, one thing we have to understand that suicide doesn't affect that person only. It affects his entire family, his, his friends, his community. It, 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 the, the afflictions go far and wide. And, and we, we all know about the Sushant Singh. Uh, at that time, it was a supposed uh, suicide. And even, even when people weren't really clear what was the cause of death, just knowing or just thinking that he probably died to suicide was really alarming and uh, it was very tough and uh, for people to comprehend that and i know how many patients came to me not only because of covid but because of sushant 
So we, we do understand that there's something called contagion, where one person's suicide or attempted suicide can affect many, many more people. So now my next question to you is, what do you think of people who die by suicide? Yeah, again, I want you to use the chat box. And what is your general impression of people who die by suicide? They are weak. Okay, Ronald, thank you for that. Yeah, they're weak. Anyone else? They do not have anyone to talk to. Okay. They're lonely. They were being put to shame. They have no hope left. They are mentally weak. It's, it's sad. They have family problems. Yeah, all that is good. But yes, very often we think that they are very weak and uh, they're afraid and they're fed up. And these are all good. Um, I mean, here we are actually empathizing with someone with, who has attempted suicide. But, you know, just think of this. Like, and, and I have been for many funerals, not many, I have been for some funerals of people who have died to suicide. And, you know, like when we're, when we're actually um, meeting with the family and we're talking to the family, we, we'll condole them and you'll see everyone will say, oh, I'm, we're really sorry for your loss. It was a very sad and unfortunate thing that happened. And, um, and you know, uh, I mean, I, I, wish the, I wish your wife would have taken another uh, way out than to, than to take this drastic step. But, uh, you know, my condolences to you. But, you know, uh, at every funeral, or rather after many funerals, you know, people have tea. You know, they'll meet, they'll gather on one side and they have tea and some snacks to serve. And, and there, when people are being natural and they're talking among their friends and talking among their neighbors, you'll find the real issues actually coming out and what people actually think will come out there. People will, will make comments like, how dare she do, do that? Didn't she, I mean, didn't she think of her husband? Didn't she think of her two little children? How could she just end her life? What a coward she was. What a selfish person she was. She, she, just, she just gave up. Couldn't she have spoken to somebody? How, to, how? You know, then they'll start pointing fingers on her. She'll point, they'll point fingers on the husband. They'll point fingers on the boss. They'll point fing fingers on everyone. And for me, I always look at this like the press, the, the, the media, the next day, when they're reporting on the newspaper, they'll actually come out and say, uh, so and so died to suicide because uh, he failed in the exam or because of a jilted love affair or the lovers. The... And my question is, how does the press even know that this is the cause? I mean, is there some kind of a hotline that we have with the dead where, they, they, where the dead speaks to them and say, you know, I died because of this reason? See, these may be just apparent visible reasons that we are seeing from the surface but internally what is happening to that person we do not know and generally the the, the jilted love affair or the or the uh, the failure in the exam could be just triggers the final trigger but it, it's much more than that it's much more than that uh, see you have like uh, Thousands of people failing in the exam, well, not everyone goes to attempt suicide. So there is a mechanism that people have that can cope with that stress. And some people are unable to cope with that stress. And it's that inability to cope with the situation which actually leads to the suicide. And, and therefore, when you think of them as cowards or selfish, I, I don't really think, I don't know whether that's the answer because, you know, I have spoken to thousands of people who are, who are, who are thinking of ending their life. I mean, talk to some mothers and the mothers will actually feel that it is better that they're not in the picture because then the husband could get married to someone else and then her children would have a better mother. So they actually feel inadequate. They feel that their presence in their family is actually harming their family. And therefore, if they are taken out from the equation, they will actually, their, their family will be in a better position. So when they're in, thinking of ending their life, they're not really thinking to harm their family, but they're actually thinking the family is good. That could be one way of looking at one narrative. Another way could be maybe a revenge. You know, they want to end their life out of revenge. So there are many reasons, but generally it's because their coping mechanisms have broken down and we need to help them to actually 
cope with their mechanisms. So my next question is, do people who die by suicide ask for help? What do you all think? Do they ask for help? Do they not ask for help? Some do. Okay. While some fail. Okay. Not quite adequately. Okay. Ronald, can you explain what you meant by that not quite adequately? Sometimes they, sometimes, but they aren't always heard. Okay. Many do, but they aren't heard. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe some may go to people they feel comfortable, but some may not have anyone, and sometimes they don't have the courage. Sometimes they do or give hints about this kind of decision. Perfect, I, I love all your answers because yes, <laughs> your answers are, are so right. Some are scared to be ashamed to ask for help. Yes, yes. And, 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 and taking from what Stephanie has said, some are scared to be and ashamed to ask for help. And what is the reason for this, this shame? Uh, Stephanie, can you, uh, you can even unmute yourself and probably can you throw an insight onto what made you say this, some are scared and they're ashamed to ask for help. What could be the reason for this? What society will think and say, okay. Yeah. Yeah, true. True. And, and, and we, we, Okay, not a problem, not a problem, Stephanie. Yeah? So, uh, so, so the reason over here is actually, it, you're right, the shame. And the shame comes from where? Because it's how people actually perceive people who, who are feeling suicidal. They feel that they're they're cowards, they're, they're, they're stupid. And how can they even think like that? And how can they even express something like dying? You know, dying is like, it's, it's the end, it's fatalistic. So how can they even think of that? And that is one of the main issues. Remember, we, we what do we say? People commit suicide, yeah? but actually commit, why the word commit came? Can anyone tell me why the word commit suicide came in? Can anyone tell me why the word commit came in? We commit crimes. We commit sins. So suicide was considered as a crime till 2017. And suicide was committed. Yeah, suicide was uh, considered as a crime and suicide was considered as a sin and is considered as a sin in many religions. But today with the understanding of what suicide is and the pathways to suicide, most religions do not look at it as a sin anymore. They look at it as a cry for help. They look at it as, uh, as a breakdown in the coping mechanisms. And therefore, uh, uh, yeah, you need a lot of courage to do it. Yes, Stephen, you're right. So, so therefore, many religions have taken a softer stand in, in, in talking about it as a sin. I know in the church, some many years back, they would not bury anyone who, who ended their life to suicide in the, in the church. They would have just a separate burial. The body would not be brought to the to the church because it was considered as a mortal sin. But now they have the stand has been changed. But they understand that it is not it's not true. But of course, they look at suicide bombers, suicide um, you know suicide used for terrorist activities as a separate form of suicide. We are here focusing more on the suicides that take place as coming from a disturbed uh, mental frame. And yes, um, so, and therefore um, uh, the answer is right. Most of you have given this answer. 
they say almost 80% of people who have attempted suicide have actually asked someone for help. 80% people have asked someone for help. Now, but yes, the way they've asked it could be different. Some people will directly say, I'm feeling suicidal, I feel like ending my life. But most people will give you indirect hints. They'll say things like, I'm fed up. I can't do this anymore. I wish I was not born. I wish I don't have to live anymore. This existence is becoming too difficult, too painful for me. I, I you know, I, I wish I could die. And, and, and many such statements. Now, now, again, it's very interesting if, and I want you to, to give me an answer to this. If 80% people have actually spoken about their intent to die, why have we lost so many people? Why do we lose so many people to suicide? Can anyone uh, throw light on this? And I'm okay if you have been unmute your mics and speak directly instead of typing. Eh? I'm okay with that. If 80% people have spoken of the intent to die, what could be the reason for so many people actually losing their life? Why, why, what was the reason why we are not able to save so many people? Okay, I'm not sure whether you can hear me now. I'm not getting any response. So, okay, yes, you can. Maybe because they haven't understood them or they couldn't really get the help that they were looking for. Yes. Because they are heard but not understood, very good. Even though they tell you they aren't understood or they're ashamed to feel so, very good. Improper guidance, very good. Very good. Maybe they look at it as a joke, yes. Very good. Very good. Very good. Maybe they look, yeah, I never thought of this, but uh, Sanjana, thank you for actually uh, sharing that. Yes, many people actually look at it as a joke. If someone is going to tell you that they want to end their life, ah, come on. Because the person they talk to take it lightly. Yes, Shruti, thank you so much. Yeah. 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 And, and all these reasons are, are very right. Uh, and therefore, it's important that we train ourselves that if someone is, is actually expressing the need to die, how do we communicate? How do we talk to them? So for this, I would like to have a little role play and uh, uh, I need a volunteer. Yeah. Would anyone volunteer, please? Kate, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So Kate, uh, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Kate, can, have you unmuted? Uh, Unmute yourself, Kate. You can't. Okay. Uh, is I think probably you're gonna put a setting of. Can you all change the setting? The host does Try not now. Host. Yes, doctor, I can now. You can now? Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, so thank you, Kate, for agreeing to, uh, to do this role play with me. Um, so we're, we're going to do a very simple role play. Okay, I'm not going to make it complicated. But uh, so Kate, you're going to, the, the, the scene will be like this. So the, the, the scene will be like this. You are going to be my teacher, okay? And I'm your student, okay? I'm Peter and your ma'am Kate. Now, okay. uh, the thing is that I just got my results and um, I have failed uh, miserably. I'm not miserably, uh, sorry, I'm not failed miserably. I, I failed in my exam and it was the final exam and I'm a good student. The thing over here is that Peter is a good student. He has actually sacrificed a lot of his um, play time or time with his friends to actually study. And uh, he was really not expected to fail, but he has failed. And he's failed just by a small margin, you know. 
and he has failed not in one subject but in like two subjects and he has failed in your subject if you teach math okay and he has failed in math and he has failed okay. in science okay so math and science is failed and now the scene is i just got my results and i am all i'm sitting all quiet and i'm kind of very emotional and i'm to myself and you're passing by in the corridor and you've seen me and you come up and you talk to me so we can start this conversation by you saying hi peter what happened okay uh, hi peter what happened uh, you seem a bit low yes ma'am um is there ma anything that you would like to share with me ma you you've seen my results I failed. I failed, ma'am. I, I how I could fail? Don't, uh, don't cry, Peter. Uh, it happens. It happens to everyone. I know you like personally that you are a very bright student, and definitely something has gone wrong. And if you if you feel free, you can share it with me. Yeah, ma'am, but. I, feel, I was not expected to fail. No, how am I going to show my face to anyone? And this is not fair. How am I going to show my face to anyone? They all laughing at me now over there. Whenever they should call me to play, I would never go. I said, "No, I have to study. I have to top this exam." And here, bloody hell, I failed in this exam. It's not right. Like uh, Peter, what I would say to you is that uh, in life, many times things don't go exactly how the way we want it to. Definitely, something might have gone wrong. In what has gone wrong? I studied. I knew all the answers. is there anything that is disturbing you uh, like mentally anything at home any family problems man what are you talking like what is what is affecting me that i failed now and how am i going to show my face at home like my parents today uh, they knew that i was going to talk to them and they said they're going to buy the pedas and keep and as soon as you go home you're going to take the pedas and go and give it to all the neighbors How can I go home now? See, Peter. Right now, you don't need to worry about that. Your my main focus right now is: Are you okay? Is everything not, okay? See, Peter. Right okay. now, you don't need to worry okay, about that. Man. Your can my main focus right now is: Are you okay? So, would you like to share with me what is what is what do you feel is not right? Okay. Is not my results. But what what do you my think is that? behind that i don't know i don't know But now now i don't care about that i'm just wondering how am i going to go home i'm going to face anyone you don't worry about that i'll speak to your parents i'll talk to them you don't know my father he kick you out of the house he'll blame you you don't know him he's a violent man Uh, so i think it will be better if you sit down and talk to your parents if that's the case i will be there i will be there along with you no i can't do this it's i can't do this it's very easy for you to say you don't know my situation i can't do this it's over for me <laughs> no peter don't give up it's not over if you want i can come with you your parents to speak to them whatever it is whatever that is troubling you will speak to what's troubling you me and i'm telling you you're not people don't understand it's easy to say next time no but right now what am i going to do Doctor, I'm lost. Anyway, thank you so much, Kate.
and I think Kate deserves a, a big round of applause. I mean, you were fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, you, but man. yes, uh, yes. So I, I want everyone's comments on 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 Kate on uh, on on the conversation we had, and I want to ask you: Did I get the help that I required? Yeah, did you did did you feel that Peter got the help that he? So Kate says she was lost. Okay. Kate, you can you can unmute yourself and tell me what made you feel that you were lost. Uh, doctor, I would say like I put, like I put myself in your position. I was not looking in a teacher's perspective. I was looking what the student might be and what he would want as an answer but so i just could not think of anything yeah true true but let's look at what i required at this point and this is open to everyone no huh? it's open to everyone kate you can also answer the other. it's open to everybody what do you think i required what did peter require at this time I, I guess a, a distraction, a distraction from at that point. Uh, so, uh, so there are two questions, two answers that have come in. One from Pulsun that says support. I required support, and Stephanie says he should have been given time to grieve to be told that it's okay to not feel okay. Okay, uh, I'll. I'll, 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 I'll I'm sorry, I'm not, speaking, I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, but proper advice. Yeah. So what was Peter going through at this point? Let's look at it this way. What was Peter going through at this point? He was going through shock. Very good. Fear. Excellent. What other emotions was Peter going through? Self-disappointment. Frustration. Very good. Trauma, confusion. Thank you so much. What else was he going through? Fear of parents and fear and shame. Very important. He was going through this huge shame. He was going through stress. He was afraid to face his parents. The shame of how he's going to face his parents and the neighborhood. Face the shame of his friends laughing at him. So this is what he was going through now. So we need to address this his emotions. What we are trying to do is trying to fix his problem, you know? And right now that advice of trying to fix his problem is not going to help him. Right now he needs someone to support him and, you know, just to be there and say, I can, I, I can, I can really understand that this is what you're going through right now. It must be so tough for you. I mean, such a great, fantastic student and you're going through and you failed, it, it, it's devastating to you. So what he needs is someone to empathize with what he's going through at this point. So I want to do this, I, I want to, I, I, I want to show you possibly how we could have done it. So Kate, can we reverse roles? Yes, sure, doctor. So Kate, you be, you be Peter, okay, and I'll be, I'll be Kate, okay, and you continue with how I started, you know, that, so, um, so, so Peter, it looks like that you're you're very disturbed at this point. Um, yes, Kate. I'm. Uh, I don't know what to do now. My parents still just they won't look at me. Like they'll they'll definitely throw me out of the house or something. I'm I'm so ashamed. I can just imagine. I I I think I can hardly imagine what you must be going through. I mean. Like I have been scoring top, I have been the top scorer for a long time and like getting this score, like such a shameful thing for my parents. Yeah, must be so devastating. I don't think they will want me as a son mm. anymore. Mm. Yeah, you feel that they may, they may reject you, that you've not done so well as you've always done. You brought pride to the family and now, now it's like, you know, you failed. Yeah. All, all my siblings are all top scorers and like me being now a disgrace to my mm. family yes 
Yes, the feeling of being a disgrace to your family, of letting them down, that itself must be so so hard for you at this point to even come to terms with it. Yes, I don't think I can go home also today. I don't know what to do. How do you even face them? How do you show your face when they are all excited? They've already bought the sweets, and and now how do you? It must be so difficult to even think. Of going home at this point. Exactly. Before the results, like they were sure I would do like really mm -hmm. great in my grades, but and, and, I have totally disappointed yeah. them. And it's like not only they were all sure, but you also were sure, like because you've always done well. It's like you you just did not expect this to happen, and and, and what is exactly? I was so shocked to look at my results. Yeah, exactly. Like, I know I've been working very hard. Like, how could this happen? Yeah, especially when you work so hard. No? And this, it's, wow. I just don't know what you must be feeling at this point. A disappointment to yourself, to your family. And, and, and as you said, even all your friends are probably just looking at you and like, you know, they said they had a good time and they passed and you always studied and you didn't pass. This must be... How do you even deal with this at this point? Yes, they all are making fun of me now, saying that you know I, I'm my parents are going to be disappointed and stuff. I don't know. I don't mm. know what to do about it. You were mentioning something that you can't go home and it's over for you. What did you mean when you said it's over for you? I don't know. My parents, I don't think they will want me anymore. I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. How do I show them my face anymore? Yeah. yeah definitely, it is going to be a big barrier. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, it's like, how do you even make that journey home? And how would you even show your face? And, and they would see it immediately. Right? They would see it immediately. They'd see the disappointment in your face. I don't you... think I can face them today or any any time after this. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you, Kate. Yeah, thank you, Kate. So, so did you see the difference in what are the differences? And this is open to everybody. What what is the difference in the way? Uh, we we the, both the conversation, the first conversation and the second conversation, in which. Uh, Kate dealt with me and the way I dealt with Kate, you know, How, what was the differences in empathizing? Okay. Yes. So, so it's, and this is important. So when we're saying that we need to empathize, we actually need to put ourselves in that person's shoes and not, and be with the person at that point in his pain at that point. So I was, I was, uh, one was you have Peter more time to talk about his feelings. Yes. So I gave, yeah, gave Peter more time to talk about his feelings, which is so important. Before you go to fixing his problems, see, you have to remember that he's in shock. Now, when you're in shock, you can't think of options. You have to first unravel or reduce that shock, the level of shock. And the way to do it is to, to put yourself in his shoes and look at the way he's feeling at this point and unravel that. Then we'll talk about everything that he's going. And then slowly he himself will come to a point of, okay, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do this. And he will understand what he's supposed to do. It is like, you know, suppose uh, a, a, a widow, I mean, you're at the funeral of a widow and she's just lost her husband of maybe 20 years of marriage. And you're telling her, don't worry, don't worry. There are plenty of fish in the sea. Don't worry, you've lost one man, but we'll get you another man. She'll say, what? Come on. I know there are plenty of other, but I, I love this man. I want this man back. And you have to empathize with what she's feeling now, not giving her solutions. Solutions will come in later on. So this is one of the mistakes that we do. A lot of people do it. It's, it's common. And this is where we lose a lot of people to suicide because even though we've spoken to someone, we've given them advice, they have not really felt it. So now my next question, is it okay to ask someone if he or she is feeling suicidal? Can we ask this question directly? Marshall says yes, Ronald says no. 
Now, how many are on Harshal's side and how many are on Ronald's side? Stephanie took the maybe, no, but indirectly. So again, the maybe, no, we can't ask it directly. And so, so I'm seeing two, two arguments. One is no, we can't ask it directly. One is saying yes, maybe. And then one is saying yes. So what is the reason we should not ask this question directly? Because someone may get offended. Okay. Number two. What is the other reason we should not ask this question directly? It's taboo. And asking indirectly would only reinforce the view that suicide is a taboo. Okay. So Harshal says asking indirectly would reinforce force that view. Even if it was on his mind, now it is. Okay, so we're saying, Katie saying we're kind of planting an idea in his mind. They might take it another way. Like what? Says, what other way they would take it in? No, because even if it might give him that idea, it, okay, so what again, planting the idea. Yeah. So, I, and this is exactly, many people did not want us to have a suicide prevention program because they say, using the word suicide is going to actually plant an idea in someone's mind. So let's go back to the conversation with Peter. Now he's saying it's over. I feel it's over. So how do we understand what he means by it's over? Yeah. How would we know what he's thinking? Hmm? He said, no, it's over for me. I can't do this anymore. He's given you a warning sign there by saying it is over. What would be our next question to him? When he's saying directly, it's over. Why it's over? Okay, but see, why will not come? Because he's already told us why. No? He's given us the answers. He said it's over because he can't handle the situation with his parents. He can't handle the situation with his friends. He can't handle the shame. He can't handle all these emotions. Don't feel like that. Yeah. Validate his feeling. But so what do you feel like? Do you feel like ending your life, Peter? Is that what you mean when it's over? Now I want to take Hushal Desai's answer. Okay. Do you feel like ending your life, Peter? Is that what you mean when it's over? Or, yeah, Kate gave a softer one. What do you mean by it's over? Yeah, so um, we, could, we, we could go with Kate's thing. What do you mean by it's over? Now, so I say it's over. You can say, what do you mean by it's over? And then suppose I give you a direct, if I, if I again play around the bush, I, I say, oh, I can't handle this. I don't know what, I, what to do anymore. It's just, it's just too overwhelming for me. You know, then maybe I could ask this question directly because see, we need to get to the point. We need to ask this question. We need to ask it directly. But it is very important when we ask it and how we ask it. So it is okay to ask this question, are you feeling suicidal? In fact, it is important to ask this question and it's important to be clear and no, you are not planting an idea in someone's mind. If they were not thinking of suicide, then they will not think of suicide. If they were already thinking of suicide, then you will know what he's actually thinking. And then you can take the proper steps. So this, this asking this question is one of the biggest suicide prevention strategies. Remember, 80% people who have died to suicide, or attempted suicide rather, have actually spoken to someone about their intent, but it was not handled sensitively. It was not handled correctly. And very often it's because we feel uncomfortable to talk about suicide. We feel uncomfortable. Now suppose the person says, yes, he's feeling suicide. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna go into panic mode. You know, and because I go on a panic mode, I easily brush that answer away. I brush it aside and I give them easy, quick fix solutions. But the thing is, we cannot take the next steps of helping the person if we do not know to what extent he is feeling. So we need to ask this question. What do you think it is that you want to do with this emotion you're feeling right now? Okay, so these are different ways in which you can ask this question, but ultimately if the person doesn't 
hit the nail on the head. Recording in progress. Uh, okay, so uh, he's actually feeding it, but if we don't ask it and don't elicit it, it, it remains with him and it grows within him. But if you ask him, he would say, wow, finally someone actually has asked me this question. And, and whenever you ask it, he has to understand that when you ask him, it is coming from a point of care and concern and not to condemn and not to put him down and not to make fun of him. Yeah? Uh, any, any questions on this? Any questions? If you have a question, please, uh, you can unmute also and ask me. Okay? Because I know this is a very tricky thing, but it's very important. Okay, no questions. Now, so now if a person says, we ask this person, he, he's saying he's giving us all these ideas that it's over, I'm fed up, and, and we have pointedly asked him, when, when, when you're saying all these things, are you thinking of suicide? And if he says no, ah, what a relief to us. He is not suicidal. But if he says yes, suppose the person says yes, he is feeling suicidal. What do you think should be our next question to him? Recording in progress. Solve your problem. See, when you ask a question like this, do you think that will help solve your problem? It's like we have not understood him. You know, we have not understood him because he's saying that he can't handle that problem. And therefore, he's come to that point. But suppose someone say, immediately, what do we need to know? See, the reason again, we know the reason. Right? In, in Kate Peters, uh, in the discussion, we know the reason. We know that he is. Uh, He's failed and he's unable to cope with it and the shame. We know all that. Do you think that's the answer to your problem? Oh, so that again is trying to put him down because he's feeling it. See, we do not want to rob him of the fact that he's feeling. Keep his dignity, preserve his dignity. So when we ask questions, do you think that's the answer? Because we are putting him down. Do you feel comfortable taking talking? Do you feel comfortable talking about the manner in which you plan to take your life? So that's, that's, that becomes an important question. So, so see, if I'm telling you, what is the next thing I want to know? I want to know whether he has thought of a plan. So I can ask him directly. Uh, so you, you say that you want to end your life. Have you thought of how you would like to do it? And I know these are very difficult questions, but these are important questions. So we need to know, ask him to elaborate on the suicidal thought. Do you think that it would put you in, put you out of your misery? Uh, yeah, so we could ask him that question, but, but first we need to do a risk assessment. You know? We need to know the level of the risk that he is going through. So the first question was, are you feeling suicidal? Yes or no? If he says no, zero risk. If he says one, risk number one, risk level one. Okay. The second one is now if he's having a risk at, at a level one risk, then the next thing is we want to know what? Whether he has a plan or not. Has he thought of how he wants to do it? What are the other questions that you think we need to ask him to check the level of risk? So plan, what else? Yeah, we need to check the plan. Then we need to check what? When are you planning? Yes, we would like to know the time. So the time will help us know whether it's an immediate danger or the danger is uh, not immediate. Yeah. Uh, yes, we need to know the plan. Any Any other?
सर प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ so location very good so have you thought of where you want to do it what else you would like to know what the plan is right so do you have a plan suppose he says yes what is that plan can you tell me about that plan the person says i want to uh, ingest pesticides okay so the person says pesticides then what do we need to know or take some medicines or some poison what what do we want to know there what would be the next logical thing that we want to know where where would he buy it from and do you have access to the pesticides good access so do you have the pesticides where are the pesticides have you bought it or have you not bought do you have it with you or not suppose the person says i don't have it with you i don't have it with me we are we are little we, we have more time but suppose the person says i have the pesticides with me what would be the next question show them to me very good very good the next thing would be what what would you do then what would you do the person has showed you the pesticides what would you do next you would keep them with me but not make it seem as if i am confiscating it yes Uh, steel is not the right word yeah but um, yes without is not without is knowledge take it away i think take it away there is no two ways about it take it away straight from him. say see i know you have these things but i have to take it from you i cannot allow you to do this take it away from him you need to protect this person keep him in a safe zone and to keep him in a safe zone it is important that you uh, remove all the means to suicide from his environment okay yeah it's important that you you take it and it's important that you take it on directly let him know that you've taken it because see if he doesn't know all that he knows okay he has an option of going and buying it again and you know of course the option is there but he knows that now someone is actually rooting for him see if you don't take it from him he will get the idea that okay i've shown it to her or him but they're not him wanting to die he will rethink his his plan so yes it is important to to take away everything if if it's not with him if it's at home somewhere you need to ask him what is the type how many tablets you have where have you kept it and probably even go to the home with him or her and confiscate The, the the substance yeah so it is important to do all these steps and and these may seem very difficult they're very heavy but this is how we actually save someone if you are not able to do this yourself what do you do next you share this information with somebody else you do not keep this confidential very often your friends will come and tell you see i'm telling you only please don't tell it don't tell my parents please tell the parents because if you are going to hold this information and god forbid that person ends his life it's forever going to be on your life, on your uh, on your conscience so please uh, share it with someone that is close to him especially the family members won't the confiscating agitate them yes it may yes it may but there is no other option but again it is how we do it you know it's always how we do it. if it's done very arrogantly and very i know i you know what is good for you and those kind of things yes it can agitate them but it always has to be done see i know you're showing this see you know we have to remember that even when someone is feeling suicidal see what is the reason they are telling you why is the what is the reason 80% has communicated this to someone else because they are ambivalent though they want to die but they also want to live 
but it's because life is becoming too difficult for them that's why they tip towards the need to die so the need to live is there also so it's slowly as we are talking to them we have to show them that there is options in life and we don't have to tell it to them direct and straight on and why didn't you think of this one you know, we we shouldn't make them look like fools that you didn't think of this option come on we should never do that we should go through their feelings and emotions and slowly they will begin to see ah oh, maybe that thought was maybe i could handle this maybe that option is there and they will begin to see options in which they can actually live their life you know and they can and do things so uh, it's important that we um, it's important that we uh, uh, what should i say um, uh, show them you no know, and open up their as we have as we have this conversation with them help them to see that the other options are available to them you know there's something called tunnel vision so a lot of people because of the stress levels are very high they are not able to look at all the options and therefore their their mind gets tunneled you know and and as we unravel their emotions they begin to see things more clear okay so this question will someone who's talking about suicide actually do it what do you all think yes or no do you think they'll actually do it when they're talking about suicide or they're just seeking attention just seeking attention they may but definitely not seeking attention ambiguous both ways it depends maybe they end up rationalizing with themselves yeah so again there's no real, real answer over here some may be actually just wanting attention definitely that that option is not not there but as we said 80% who have spoken about it actually ended their life so we do not know when they speaking about whether they actually they really want to end their life or they seeking attention and because we are not sure it is better to take everybody seriously who talks about suicide seriously because that risk is there because 80% so if you look at 1 million people 800000 people have actually spoken about it and they have killed themselves so never take anyone lightly when they when we talk about suicide treat every case as a case of uh, a serious case and those who are just wanting attention probably they need probably they've come in their life where where they realize that you know some people are, are, are always yes people you cannot say no to them you say no they they cannot handle it so maybe they have to learn new coping mechanisms you know and therefore not just use the word suicide frivolously so what are some of the warning signs of an impending suicide talking we just spoke about talking about killing themselves feeling trapped having no reason to live being a burden to others uh the mood changes they feel down feel irritable feel anxious lose interest in life and behaviorally behave yes distancing themselves from others very good and behaviorally suddenly there's an increased use of alcohol or drugs acting recklessly suddenly riding your bikes very fast getting into smoking unprotected sex uh withdrawing from activities that uh, which you normally enjoy doing it sleeping too much or sleeping too little aggression uh this is these are very important things visiting or calling people to say a goodbye a final goodbye so you know they're just going and meeting again to say goodbye and giving away your prized possession this is huge many people have missed this sign they've actually given out their uh things that they really treasured they're giving it out people suddenly making out a will keeping their affairs in order you know we need to take all these seriously now i want to being law students i would like you to look at this um the slide very very closely and you'll see on the on the left you'll see boxes in blue and on the right you'll see boxes in in pink now when we look at suicide prevention we look at actually universal preventions okay at the risk factors at universal level and more at a specific individual level 
So uh, at an individual level, we see a previous suicide attempt, mental disorders, harmful use of alcohol, hopelessness, pain, family history, and genetic. Now, if you look at this, previous suicide attempts is something that we can work with. So if someone has attempted suicide, we need to follow them up. We cannot just let them go. And there is no, there is no programs at all right now uh, in India, which actually follows up people who have attempted suicide and uh, who survived and working with them. Uh, access, uh, okay, mental disorders. So a lot of people are still untreated. So creating awareness on, on mental illnesses, on the harmful use of alcohol, you know, creating this awareness and that helps. Now, if you look at the relationships, you see a sense of isolation, lack of social support, relationship conflict, discord, loss. So again, it's working with people with, with domestic violence, people living in abusive uh, relationships, people who are, uh, who are the victims of domestic, of intimate partner violence. And today you see a lot of couples, a lot of couples seemingly look very happy. They're actually going through a lot of abuse in the bedroom. And, and the abuse could be uh, sexual, it could be emotional, it could be just their the spouse not talking to them, or the spouse using them only for sexual gratifications, or probably it's the type of sexual uh, acts that they, they would like to do, which is not uncomfortable to the other partner. Uh, and, and many of these kind of issues called intimate partner violence is actually one of, one of huge reasons for suicide. And if you look at the cause of suicide in India versus that of the West, in India, uh, only 60% of those who end their life are due to a mental illness, but almost 40% are due to some kind of a relationship discord. Whereas in the West, that number drops to only 10% and 90% are due to mental illnesses. So what we're seeing, 40% of suicides can be prevented if, if we just find the, the right support for people going through uh, problems with their relationships. Now, barriers for accessing health care, this is huge. So today, a lot of people don't have access to, to health uh, healthcare, and, and therefore laws are required to make sure that this is implemented. Access to means, and this is what we're working on right now at Cooch, how do we prevent access to means? See, today, uh, we know that there are there are laws regulating the sale of pesticides to, to young people below the age of 18. However, we know of so many cases of suicide where, where a student wearing their uniform has actually gone to a shop and purchased, uh, purchased uh, probably a rodenticide or a pesticide, taken it, the shopkeeper sold it to the student in the in, in uniform, and the person has actually spread it nicely on the bread, taken a sandwich, eaten, eaten the pesticide. So these kind of barriers. We have the second barrier. We look at, look at our bridges. A lot of suicides take place from jumping from bridges. So if we can just make these bridges safer, okay, a lot of people will uh, can be saved. And we've seen it. After our Yellow Ponda program uh, some years back, which we had the whole suicide prevention campaign in Ponda, subsequently they, they put railings on the Bori Bridge. And that was a hotspot to suicide. Today now the, the rate of suicide on the Bori Bridge has come down to zero. People may argue, okay, now you put it on one bridge, you may shift to another bridge. That actually does not happen. Somehow in the world, there have been these hotspots to suicide. And when they have kind of, um, created safety nets around these hotspots, it is not shifted to another place. And this research has done, been done globally where they found that uh, creating a safety net on one bridge does not make another bridge that does not have that safety net a hotspot to suicide. So this is something that we can work on in Goa. The inappropriate media reporting, there are guidelines for reporting of suicides, which many media houses are not following and if they can just follow this we will reduce the contagion of suicide we'll reduce the education that people get on how to commit suicide today today if you look at ratol ratol has been advertised so much on the press that today it has become one means of, of suicide which has been actually the media has shown the world how we can end, end their life if these methods don't work try out this method so uh, we need uh, to to create this uh, 
this awareness among the media, which we have been doing. But again, if, if there are some legal ways in which we can do it, that, that's much better. Okay. So I shall go to the next slide. So this is what I've already told you about the levels of risk. If someone says, uh, ask them whether there's suicide intention, zero is no, no risk, one is risk. If they say two, it is they have a thought and they have a plan. And three is they have the thought, the plan, and the means to end their life. So how do we respond? We ask people directly, do you intend to commit suicide? Do you have a suicide plan? Do you have what you need to carry out your plan? Do you have means? Do you know when you would want to do it? What is the time and where would you want to do it? Check out for the place. And it's important that people say yes to this, and especially if they are level three risk, the high risk, we should never, never leave them alone, even for a second. Because it just takes a second to, to harm yourself. So never leave that person. Always keep a supervision of at least one meter distance. And, and, and yes, again, one of the issues over here that we have in Goa is that we do not have um, a decent place. <laughs> it's the wrong word I'm using. But if you see someone's having a suicidal thought and he needs to be admitted, very often these problems are not due to a mental illness, as I said. It's due to a, a social problem. And therefore, they don't want to get admitted in the Institute of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, in IPHB. Neither they're very comfortable in staying in private hospitals, or probably they can't afford a private hospital. And therefore, we need to have safe places where someone who's having suicide ideas that can check into a place. It doesn't feel like a hospital, but it feels like a secure, safe place where they can talk to someone. They can share what they're feeling. They can feel loved. They can feel validated and, and not doused with medicines only, you know? So they need to be in an environment which feels more, um, more uplifting to them. And that is something which we do not have in our country. And that is something which I think Goa being a small state is something which we can work towards, but uh, yeah. So how do you respond? Ensure safety, remove all the drugs, knives, other potential lethal uh, objects from the vicinity. Um, take the person to an emergency room if the suicide seems imminent. Let them speak to a mental health professional. Uh, do not promise confidentiality. Do not under any circumstances leave a suicidal person alone. And it's very important that you do not argue with that person. You don't tell, how can you even think of suicide? This is not you, you should never think of it. You have to remember that the most intelligent people have ended their life. People who, 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 are, who are comedians, who are public figures, they have ended their life. Religious people have ended their life. Students who are, who are bright students have ended their life. So suicidal thoughts can come to anybody. And, and it is because, not that they want to end their life, but it's just because they've come to the point where that seems uh, like a solution. Therefore, let's not argue with them. If we argue with them, we are robbing them. You know, we are, we are not, we're not addressing the stress that they are going through. But if, yeah. Do not lecture and advise and say, how can you think of this? Haven't you thought of your family? Yes, they have thought of their family, but right now they're also thinking of themselves. And they do not know how to deal with the situation. So let's not advise them and lecture them. Let's not act shocked when they say, oh my God, you? How can you think of it? You know, when, when, we, when, we, when we react this way, then people do not share their, their emotions with us. So if we want people to be transparent and to share, and therefore they get a complete diffusing of their feelings, we need to respond to them also adequately. Not adequately, but appropriately. Let's not offer ways to fix their problem. Over here, everyone is trying to fix Peter's problem. I'll go home with you. I'll take you, I'll talk to your father. Remember that those are temporary things and they may never work because maybe as, as Peter said, see, you don't know my father. My father's a very violent man. He'll, he'll blame you and you know. So please never offer to fix their problems. You have to empower them to see how they can handle their problems. And if you've done everything in your power and everything, you cannot blame yourself if that suicide did take place. So yes, what we need to do is we need to be ourselves. We need to listen. We need to be empathetic, non-judgmental. And, and you know, 
these may seem very easy words but as we saw in our conversation they're very very difficult to follow and it's nice for you to see see but see we've all made mistakes in our life no one has been perfect nobody has been perfect we all made mistakes in our life we all uh, are ashamed of so many things that we've done which we are not really proud of but who can we share this with somebody imagine suppose you are you are the principal of the college you are the, you're a teacher you are for me i'm a doctor and i've got this um, impression that i've created in society but i've also done things that i'm not proud of who can i share this with what are the qualities in that person i will look out for if i want to share something personal about myself i would want that person to to be trustworthy i would want that person to to maintain confidentiality i would want that person that even if i'm talking about some very really the secret of mine things that i'm not proud of that he would still respect me and treat me in the same dignified way even after knowing this information from me i would want him not to judge me i would want him not to really give me advice and throw why did you do this you should have done that and how could you do this no i don't want that i want him to listen to me i want him to be there so that i can share i can feel the love of another human being with me in my pain and in my situation and this is what we need to be to our friends when they go through pain also and this is something that uh where the world is lacking we have a lot of friends on facebook we have a lot of friends that we hang out with but very rarely we have someone who can share our most darkest secrets and i feel if you have someone like that you have a treasure and it's important to find that person keep their contacts always on your phone because if you're having a stressful situation speak up you know so suicide prevention tips there are three one is speak up if you're worried if you have a little slight even a slight uh, inclination that this friend of yours or this family member might be at a risk of suicide speak up respond quickly in a crisis don't say ah tomorrow morning no today is feeling suicidal he might end his life today don't uh, push it for tomorrow and offer their help and support continuously these are three very important tips that you can follow now coach runs this suicide distress helpline the number is 2252525 your operation from monday to friday between 1 and 7 pm uh, and we offer this kind of listening we offer this kind of empathy where people can call in and talk to us about any of their stresses whatever is worrying them and uh, we promise that we will not uh, i mean we we promise that space in which you can feel comfortable to share anything we we do not ask, i mean even if your name is asked you don't have to share it with us we don't need to know who you are where you're from what you do all those details are immaterial we just need to you to share your pain and we are there for you this help i also runs purely on um on volunteers and if anyone would like to learn how to listen and how to listen uh, at a very deep level we are we are having a training in november it's a five day online training from 2:30 to 7:30 in the afternoon so if anyone is interested uh, they can do this course and if you're interested in sitting and volunteering at the helpline also i mean from where you are you don't have to come to the helpline now we transfer the calls to your home uh, to your phone uh, you're welcome to do that so uh, i i would i would appreciate if you can share this number with your students and with your friends and your families put up on facebook anywhere it will be helpful any questions students if you all have any questions please ask any questions sir i think there are no question from the audience so we can move ahead okay so uh, okay fine uh, just one thing is i'd like one photograph of uh, 
everyone on the server. Is that possible? Yes. Uh... Is it possible that people put their videos on and we can just take out a picture, do a picture? Students, kindly put your videos on. I'll stop sharing this. No? I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for this enriching talk. Uh, I hope our students have gathered an in, uh, new, new input regarding suicide prevention. Now, I request Dr. Gorati Simois to kindly give a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Archana. Uh, good afternoon to one and all. Uh, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. So on behalf of the Center for Counseling and Wellness Management, so also the IQAC, I take this privilege to wholeheartedly express my profound gratitude to our dynamic resource person. Dr. Peter Castellino, Director and Managing Trustee, Cooch Mental Health Foundation, for deliberating in depth about the topic on suicide prevention. Sir, your well articulated questions put forth and deliberations made. So, also the role play showcased made us realize the gravity of the matter. But it still remains a complicated issue. And Goa is not an exception, as you have very well rightly said. Sir, your valuable inputs will surely go a long way in training our minds to prevent suicide, as the saying goes, that prevention is better than cure. Thank you once again for having spared your valuable time and energy in expressing your viewpoint on the topic that you hold very close to your heart. I would also like to express my profound gratitude to our principal, Dr. Saba Da Silva, who always inspires us to think out of the box and initiate such interactive sessions. Thank you, sir, in absentia for your constant cooperation. I am also indebted to Ms. Archana Kucharkar, counselor of the institution, for having taken this initiative to host the program. It was indeed worth the effort. A word of gratitude to our system administrator, Akshay Chari, for his tireless efforts to render technical assistance and to deal with logistics. Last but not the least, showers of gratitude to our students for having taken active part in this interactive session in large numbers. Appreciate you all. Thank you, one and all. Have a very good afternoon. Thank you and God bless. Uh, students, you may leave the meet now. Uh, feedback form will be sent to you later. So I end my session.